Although the history of the people in the LGBTQ plus community goes back to history itself, the story we have to tell has to start somewhere. Even though there is no clear beginning, the roots of the movement can be found in every time period. It was in America's adolescence that we begin to look at how the modern gay rights movement began to take form. Post-World War I America saw a nice rise in the economy, because that's usually what happens post-war if you're America. The 20s brought an age of what a lot of people like to call a sort of sexual liberation. There are ways to analyze the various sociological theories at play here. However, in a few words, things changed. Civil rights attitudes were becoming apparent to white people though, and I say this because people of color have been aware of the terrible situation since ever. Marcus Garvey and the Pan-African movement were gaining rapid traction around the country. But World War I was a time where queer people started realizing that other queer people existed. Blue discharges were given to soldiers who were believed to be homosexual or generally unfit, and often were disproportionately given to people of color. People who received these charges did not receive benefits from the VA, as the GI Bill prohibited people who had blue discharges from receiving benefits. It was often difficult to find a work or a place in society, as there was a negative connotation of having a blue discharge. Being LGBT was a crime and was seen as a mental illness, so it was not uncommon for LGBT people to be sent to mental institutions. As many men went off to war, many women took up factory work and contributed to the effort. Women's increased visibility in the workplace changed how society viewed them. In 1920, women in America were victorious in fighting for the right to vote. Over time, women in the 20s experimented with traditionally masculine gender roles. They enjoyed flapper culture and sexual liberation, and shorter hair. Lesbian subculture was beginning to form. Cities were gaining people in the millions, and diversity in the American population was as present as ever. Mass culture through media was on the rise, and queer identities and its presence in American culture was on the rise as well. Hollywood, since this is before the Hayes Code, or the Censoring Motion Picture Code of America, looked for shocking ways to get the general audiences to watch films. They tried to use queerness as a gimmick to get people to watch. The effeminate man was here for laughs, the butch woman for snickers. However, queer viewers were attracted in some ways to cinema for the chance to see themselves on screen. Queer people fought in the war and came to a world that rejected them. Queer people worked in their countries and faced backlash every day. Sometimes they found solace in gay bars that remained secret and unnamed. One of the only places that explicitly mentioned queer people around this era was the many psychological studies that tried to analyze them. Henry Gerber Henry Gerber was a German immigrant to the United States. He was sent to a mental institution for being gay and after leaving, fought in World War I for the United States. Working in Berlin during the war, he discovered the thriving queer subculture. He decided to start the Society for Human Rights here in America, the first homophile institution in the United States. Although it was exclusionary to bisexuals, which I am quite sad about, it is important to note for being the first queer organization in the United States. Alan L. Hart Alan L. Hart was a doctor who led the way for x-ray being used for tuberculosis detection. It's a really great thing because if you haven't noticed, everyone in that time period died from TB. Like everyone. He was one of the first trans men to medically transition, and had a successful medical practice. His medical transition is the first documented medical transition in America. William Haynes Haynes was a prominent actor during the 20s, and started in wildly successful films. He was open about his relationship with Jimmy Shields, despite being a male heartthrob of sorts. Even though most people lived in half-denial that Haynes was just living platonically with another man, most knew Haynes and Shields' relationship. When the secret became too open, Haynes lost his job. Queer history never began or ended during this time period. The Great Depression hit around 1929 and people began to lose track of LGBTQ rights. Religion spread to keep public morale, and the Hayes Code acted as a brutal censor on the motion picture industry in America. The queer movement was silenced for decades, but as America entered the Second World War and found a place on the world stage, we'll find where the post-war boom takes the culture, and how mass culture and conformity prompted thousands of youth to rebel. Tune in next time for another LGBT by the Decades. My mom, when, she, when I told her I was gay, actually took me to like a psychiatrist. And I remember coming out and the psychiatrist being like, there's nothing wrong with your daughter, she's perfectly healthy. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, and my mom was like, no.
watching TV, you see a lot of, you know, fairy tales, and you see men and women, men and women getting married. You hear it in songs. You just everything. You're surrounded by like heteronorms. So I was really trying to、um, mold myself into what. A straight man looks like a lot of it's kind of a blur because I was trying to be someone other than me. It was just like kind of like a transition from like I'm a tomboy, I'm a tomboy to like oh I'm like really really different. I had、uh, a best girlfriend,、uh, a friend that's a girl who's my best friend,、um, and about the same time that I came out, she did as well, and it, it was just really helpful to have two people doing that at the same time, and it kind of brought us closer together. Even when I was. Coming out, like I still had the things that I've heard from like friends and family growing up about, you know, gay people.、Um, there were still those attitudes left over in my mind, so I had to like really educate myself and immerse myself into that community and that world. I've been more comfortable with talking about it, but it's still not something that I'll come out and say, "Hi, I'm Jen. I'm bi." <laughs> One of my closest friends, I had been talking to her about how、I'll I had been dating a a girl, and I really thought she was really cute. But I also <laughs> liked a guy too. And she said she got really fed up with me. And she said, "Well, you have to pick sometime, like whichever one you're going to be with. What does their gender have to do with how I feel about them?" When people find out you're gay, like it, it, like it, it raises something. In them, they feel endangered. They want to change you. And I've even had a priest once in high school tell me that, you know, I need to redeem my life、um, in my sociology class in front of the whole class. And、I、had an argument with him. Speaking up for myself publicly was a really, really empowering moment for me at such a young age. There are so many different colors on the LGBTQ spectrum. You know, there's trans. There's you know lesbians, bi, you know gender fluid, gender queer. There's so many subgenres of like you know people that exist in our community. At the end of the day, I really had to accept that there wasn't really a single subculture that was gonna define me. I had to accept that I was made of all of these things, and that all of these identities don't necessarily make me. Be accepting of yourself,、um, even though other people might not do it. Maybe I lost a few Facebook friends over it, but. At the end of the day, that's okay. How you feel is not what everyone says that you are. I know that sounds a little confusing. <laughs> you're gonna have to own it. You're gonna have to get your spoon. You're gonna have to dig down deep and be like, all these layers are mine. And the sooner you do it, the sooner you'll really know yourself.